At Prodigy Leadership Academy, we are raising up tomorrow's leaders. And Talks with Titans is just one of the ways that we're facilitating the passing of torches from people who have lived lives of success and impact onto our students. On today's episode, two of our students, Bethany and Lena, had the privilege of sitting down with Mrs. Cheryl Modis. Cheryl was truly amazing. I have never met her before the day that we had the chance to sit down and speak with her. And I was pretty well blown away. Later that day when I posted on Facebook that we had had the chance to sit down and speak with her, the first comment said, Cheryl, AKA Wonder Woman. Let's see, just a few of the things that really stood out about Cheryl to me were, one, she's just such a warm and, and friendly and kind spirited person. She's been successful in three different career paths. So you'll definitely wanna listen and find out what those were because none of them were easy most people would be happy with just one of these. And another thing that was absolutely mind-blowing was um, she and her husband's just uh, radical generosity. She said that they had had a goal to be able to reach, um, like for most of their lives, to reach a point where they were able to give away not just 10%, they've gotten up to 80%. 80% of everything they make, they just give away. So I'm so excited for you to get to hear from Mrs. Cheryl Modis. I have gone to many different schools. I've gone to seven. I started at a community college in Hutchinson, Kansas, grew up on a farm in Hutchinson, raised cattle and wheat farming, went to a community college, then went to Kansas State University because they had planned on having a bachelor's program in nursing. I always knew I wanted to be a nurse in my first career. And then they did not get that bachelor's program in time, so I transferred to Pittsburgh State University, Pittsburgh, Kansas. <laughs> Not, not on the east side of the U.S. Um, and then um, worked in different intensive care units. Got my master's in nursing from Wichita State University in Kansas. Um, moved a few times to get promotions. And then I had never heard of Cape Girardeau, but I was recruited by St. Francis. Mm -hmm. While I was at St. Francis, and that was 32 years ago, and I was there eight years, while I was there, I got my MBA, my master's in business administration from Washington University. Then um, just a few years ago, two years ago, basically, I got my PhD in holistic nutrition. Um, between the MBA and the holistic nutrition degree, I, I got my CFP, which is a certified financial planner. And that was harder than all of them combined. <laughs> It really hurt my mental health, I believe. <laughs> but, but anyway, it, it helped me be a better uh, person, a, a better, technically a lot better in my career field. Um, and the other thing is, you know, um, doing those different degrees um, in my first degree in nursing, there was a book by, um, I don't remember her first name, but I believe her last name is uh, Benner. And it's called From Novice to Expert. And I highly recommend that book. I don't know if you have heard of it, but no matter what field you are in, we start all over again in our, in our journey many times. And we start as novices and getting used to that being a new person with a new map, with a new not knowing your surroundings, um, it, it is reassuring to know that then you go through these next steps to become an expert and how great it feels to be an expert. And whether it's as a student or a, whatever your career is. So can you just give us an overview um, of like your testimony and how God has worked in your life? Oh, it's, it's just so incredibly difficult to even put into words. Um, I say every day that God is crazy good and the universe conspires in our favor and that's God. You know, just it's always in our favor. And I really liked in your opening ask, your, your request of me to be interviewed, um, you used the words passing the torch to younger generations. Um, every morning I I, I work out, I do some yoga and stretching, and I do a prayer during that time. But then I also have, I don't even know what you would call it, kind of a mission statement. And um, it, it is, I work passionately every day to become my best and most generous self, spiritually, physically, professionally, morally, and intellectually. So I first can serve God to His highest. But my, my heart's desire is to help others live lives that are beyond their hopes, 
use my influence to shape beliefs about faith, nutrition, and feminism, and to intentionally coach younger women to change our future. So, and nothing against younger men, but I, I don't have the influence on them, you know, as a role model that I do on, on younger women. My life is a gift, and what I do with it is a gift to God and others. And with your language passing the torch to younger generations, you may have already read George Bernard Shaw's, I'm of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community. Are you familiar with that? And it's my honor to work as hard as I can, as long as I can to pass it on. And that's a lot of the reason why I'm a Methodist, because that was John Wesley's, the founder of Methodism. That was his focus was do all you can for others. Um, and then it ends with Matthew 5, 14 and 16, you're the light of the world. And so God's um, hand and his love, as undeserving as I am, has always, always been there. And he has surrounded me with goodness and great mentors and great friends in the faith and in other faiths um, that have really changed me. I hope that was your answer to the yeah. right question. <laughs> yeah, that was really good. Um, so I heard that you mentioned mentors. Um, yeah. So how did you find um, a mentor or did yeah. the Lord just like provide you one like right in front of you? Right. Or? So so many times it was provided. Mm -hmm. um, my father and mother, I mentioned earlier, um, were really kind of ahead of their time in, in helping us understand that they're there are no barriers. Um, you can do anything and put God first and the doors will open. So they, they are my best mentors. Um, and then in my career, there's, a, you know, there's, there's sometimes a perception about women that, that we don't help each other, but I never, ever experienced that. And as a critical care nurse, I had amazing mentors. I was in a field that was 96% at the time female. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense that my mentors were female. Then as I moved up as an assistant vice president of nursing, assistant vice president or vice president of patient services, my mentors were women. Mm -hmm. And they were just, oh, they were just excellent. And they cared about mentoring me and passing that torch on and develop my own development. Um, spiritually, my mentors have, have been men and women who, who have been friends or um, in a former role, my Sunday school teachers and um, church leaders. Um, and then in my current field, um, it's, it's amazing how I went from one, one career that was 96% female to a career that was 88% male. And so over 25 years, how that has changed, which is, you know, they have embraced bringing women in and supporting us and, and mentoring. And then um, mentoring, mentors in the field of nutrition, because that was new to me. Um, we didn't know anything about the restaurant business, nothing. We just knew that there was no place healthy to eat in our community. Um, so learning from them and then um, my, my real desire in the field of nutrition is to help heal health care because health care is very broken. We, we have a faucet that's always running and the sink is overflowing and medications are the mop. You know, we just keep giving people instead of shutting off that faucet, which is, you know, the upstream issue of um, what we put into this vessel. And what we put into the vessel, whether it's our minds or our bodies or our hearts, our spirits, you know, is, is the key, in my opinion, to our success. And those mentors filled me with the good gas to, to do well and open doors for me, which is another reason why I'm very passionate about being a good mentor and not being lazy one. <laughs> what do you think that younger people today need to learn and know? First and foremost, that they are good. There's negativity sometimes about that younger generation. There was when I was 16. And I, w I remember being in Stafford, Kansas and watched, walking out of a grocery store and I was dressed different because, you know, it was the 60s, 70s, you know, and these women looking at me and you could just tell they were making comments about me and feeling disheartened about that because I knew I was a good person 
and not knowing how to process that and talking to my mom and dad about that and them saying, don't, don't worry about that, sweetie, that just don't, don't let that affect you. And I have clients who will come in and they're older and they'll be negative about, oh, we can't get people to work. We can't get, they're always on their cell phones. And I, and I just say two things. One is I have mentored lots of people in my career and we've had lazy people that are age 60 today, lazy people who are age 40 today. And they're, they're always going to be there. And I see young people on fire who are bolder than I ever was about my faith, who are stronger, who are more creative. Um, So first and foremost, know know that the future is bright and that you you are good. Your generation is really, really great. And then, you know, the education that Prodigy is offering you, which is a new way of looking at education, is just you know, the best investment you could have. Mm -hmm. Leaning into your strengths, uh, addressing any weaknesses, um, personalizing your education. It's, It's just amazing. I feel like I had a really, really good education and it prepared me in knowing how to study and knowing how to be a team member and helping me develop team leader skills. But I think yours is just ramped it up like, you know, you're, you're definitely going to have those skills. So you mentioned your work in nutrition and uh, also you mentioned your husband earlier and, and the work with uh, fresh, healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Fresh, healthy Mm -hmm. cafe. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes. I'm happy to, as a nurse in my first career, I really cared about health and fitness and taking care of the vessel and If you go back 50 years to when my husband went to Vietnam, 10% of those who enlisted or were drafted could not be accepted because of their health conditions. Today, even though those standards have been relaxed, 75% of age 18 to 24 could not meet the qualifications to join. And it's because of what we're consuming. We had one in 100 people had diabetes 50 years ago, one in 10 today. And it's because of what we're eating and drinking. And the reason I got my PhD, I well, let me back up. The reason we started fresh was because I and, and my niece went over to Carbondale and they had a plant-based, we, we know plants are the key. Fiber is the key. It's not glamorous, but fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and beans are exactly what God gave us in their whole wonderful, perfect form that work together for this vessel to be healthy. Um, So we know that. And we were in Carbondale and they have a plant-based, they have a vegan restaurant over there. And I'm like, I came home. I said, Rick, we have got to do this. He's no, we are not going to do restaurants. That was on a Saturday night. The next morning we were getting ready to go to church and I spun him around his chair. I said, yes, we are going to do this. We have to do this. He said, well, okay. And he said, but I know one thing, it won't succeed if it's vegan, not in this demographic. Vegan is you don't eat anything um, that's related to an animal, milk, cheese, meat. Um, And you can be a very bad vegan, truthfully. You can eat just cookies. That's not a good thing. So we wanted a whole food plant-based menu. We knew that that would not work, but we also knew we knew nothing about restaurants. So we needed a franchise and we researched that a lot. We found Fresh Healthy Cafe. We don't serve anything on four legs. There's no pork and there's no beef. Um, There's no lamb. I would, I could never do that anyway. (laughs) Um, but it, uh, but it does have some dairy and it does have turkey and some chicken, but we also offer analogs, which are, um, like chicken and like turkey and like, and very similar to cheese only made from plant products. So, um, I was writing for the franchise because I was self-taught. I had research, 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 read a lot of books and, I was reading the book, How Not to Die, by uh, Dr. Michael Greger. Dr. Greger's superpower is decoding research to make sure it's valid, that every step of the process was followed. If not, it 
it's pitched, and then translating that into words we can understand. And I was reading the book, How Not to Die, and I had just read a section, and I was listening to the morning news as I was getting ready, and Gail King said in a very brief little clip that um, a recent a recent study showed the direct link between fried foods and breast cancer. And I just read about the 1987 study that showed a direct link between f- fried foods and breast cancer. And I'm like, we got to do something. <laughs> and I can't do it as a once upon a time nurse that's self-studied. So that's why I got my PhD, so that I could have that credential and credibility. So it allows me to have a morning radio spot on KHIS radio every morning, a healthy tip of the day. And then I do some things for the newspaper. I do public speaking. And then I write for Fresh Healthy Cafe and I help us adjust our menu as as well. And our our fella in Canada, the owner is very open-minded, very, he does not have a degree. He just wants to help people be healthier. So he's very open to all of that. We uh, introduced, for example, we were the ones who introduced and now it's in the system for all franchisees, the energy bites and falafel. <clears throat> we need to eat three be- servings of beans a day. That's a lot of beans. You know, hummus is one way to get it. Falafel is another great way to get it. Um, black beans in your salad, um, chickpeas in your smoothie, red beans on top of your soups or in your soups. So um, that's how that happened. And I interestingly talked to individuals all day about wealth and really our health is our wealth. We, we can't witness to others for that long time that Christ, that God wants for us. We cannot do our best in serving him if we don't feel good. And many Americans don't feel good because they have conditions. Those conditions can progress to diseases, but those diseases and conditions are really conditioned upon what they're doing with their bodies. Um, They think it's genetic in their minds, but 10% is genetics. 90% of it is what we learned from our parents and how they cooked and ate and didn't move. It's not in our genes. And that's very exciting to me because we can change that. Mm -hmm. And we know the science and how to change it. We just go back to the way we were 50 years ago with no fast foods, with no added salt, with no added sugar, with no saturated fats added and chemicals. And if you don't know, do you know about Yuka, the app? Have you heard about Yuka? It's super cool. Y-U-K-A. And it's based, I want to say in the United Kingdom, so it's more strict. They would never allow the additives that we allow. So it's stricter. The, The scoring is harsher, if you want to call it that. But you can scan any barcode in, in the store, whether it's a soap or a shampoo or uh, any food product, and it gives a score and it tells you the toxic chemicals in it. And for example, Zevia soda, if you've heard of it, you pour it out and it's clear. That it's Even though it's Dr. Zevia, like Dr. Pepper, and there are no hazardous compounds in it. Whereas if you scan a Dr. Pepper, you'll see all of the hazardous compounds. Mm-hmm. Um, you can pay $15 a year <laughs> for the upgrade to the app and you don't have to scan anything. You can type it in. And so it's really fascinating. And sometimes the cheapest things are cleaner than the expensive products. And the key really is to buy things that have no label. You know, a tomato does not have a nutritional label when you pick it up. It's real. It's the real deal. Now, when you go to the store, you can find bags of frozen broccoli, cauliflower, and carrots, and that's fine if that's the three ingredients, but watch out for anything else. Mm-hmm. Those are whole foods, but um, we've denatured them by adding other things. I get super passionate about it. <laughs> can't, <laughs> because we this, can't tell it all. And, uh, <laughs> this vessel can work so great. And I, I sleep good. I pop up like toast every morning. I have high energy and people want to know how I do it. You know, God's grace is first and foremost that he has given me health, but it's the fuel that we put into it. And I, 
pray that I can undo a lot of the things I did for 50 years. You know, the things that we ate and just didn't, you know, know or think. Everybody, everybody does that. So anyway, the great thing is younger people care more. They are more discerning about what they're putting in the vessel. And they're very, very, very careful, in my opinion, what I see about what they put in their baby's mouths. They're thinking about nutrition before pregnancy and during pregnancy and then what they're feeding these little ones. And so I think that movement, they also care about the climate. They care about the environment and what animal production is doing to that. Mm -hmm. So I think our future is bright. We'll move that needle. <laughs> I just hope I live long enough <laughs> to see it. So thank you for that question. Yeah, I live on a farm and awesome. we are really into the health Great. thing. And my father feels like everything, even in most health food stores, is also bad for you because it's not natural-ish because it right. still is like processed. You take that yucca app to a health food store and they do have the organic seeds and beans and that type, which is good but there's there's a lot of i mean supplements supplements have been totally denatured extracts what did they extract you know just eat the cranberries don't get the cranberry extract who knows what they did to it um just because uh, one of the things that i so respect about you is and i'd like you to just talk about it a little bit it's it's you work in a field around a material thing, mm -hmm. right? Like money. Um, but I know you and I know that my experience of you is that everything you do does bend towards um, making the lives of other people better, stronger, healthier in, mm -hmm. in all the ways we talk about relationally, spiritually, um, emotionally so just talk if, if, if you're following what i'm trying to say could you just talk a little bit about that through your different areas of work that you do yeah. um uh, but particularly around what you're doing now with yeah. with wealth management and growth it's it's similar to i i raised cattle till i was 40 but I haven't eaten any animals since I was 32. So those eight years were quite a conflict, <laughs> you know, but my father was a cattle person and the most humane individual. I mean, he would never have struck an animal or shocked an animal or anything else that, you know, was painful. But there's a reality of what happens to them and those beings. Um, so that that was very, very difficult for me. And some people could see in my field being, a, I'm a minimalist. Um, I don't care that my shoes came from Kohl's or that my car is eight years old and our house is great. It's livable, but it's it's not what my peers have. Um, and, I, and we don't care. The, my field that I'm in could be seen as one of greed and um, uh, excess and Edward, and my company is not that way, but, but many companies on Wall Street can be seen as that. And it's also been a very, um, a very difficult field for women. I mean, difficult for those before me and still for some on Wall Street. So there can be that friction or that, um, you know, that sense of ethical dilemma with what am I promoting here? And I have really struggled with that because Rick and I, um, our, my world was changed. <laughs> our world was changed when we heard a speaker at, at my one of our meetings at work, a speaker say, talk about um, they were giving 80% away of what they earned. And that was like, oh my gosh, you know, so I wanted to know more. And there was a whole group of doing that. So I learned more. And we, in fact, how I learned about John and his wife and their ministry was through a group that we started that was a generosity group, just helping each other learn to be more generous. And I was the leader of that group. And we went to generosity conferences and it completely changed how we feel about um, currency, money, 
and um, what it can do and and that it's not ours at all, not at all. Um, and I'm saddened in many ways by the lack of generosity. Uh, there's sometimes this sense that if I'm giving 10%, I'm done. I'm a really good person, <laughs> you know, and that's between you and God, obviously. But what they're missing is if you do more, oh my gosh, number one, what you get back in your heart by, by what, what God can do to multiply that. And then it, it just changes your framework. So um, Rick and I intended that first year to double what we were giving from 10% to 20. And at the end of the year, we'd done 30 and didn't really even know it because I was giving on the credit card and he was giving, <laughs> and you know, on the checkbook, you know. And so we have continued that to the point where we are almost at 80%. And, and, and we're fine. And no, we don't have as much in our portfolio or as many properties or whatever, but we've got, we've gained so much from that. And so I try to weave that. I, I don't want to offend anyone at all. And I hope I don't offend anyone here, but I would not spend it's probably more than five dollars on on a coffee at one of when you drive through. Let's just say Starbucks. I I would never do that. I mean that ends up in the toilet right away. You know, and you you know it's gone. Mm -hmm. And I would never buy fireworks. You're just burning up money. <laughs> you know, it's just, it just doesn't make sense to me. But I also know that the people who go through that drive through at Starbucks enable the college students who are working there to have a paycheck. The woman who makes the biscottis, wherever she is in her business, to hire people and to grow her business. The carpet people to have, you know, a light a income. The bug person who does the, you know, extermination. I mean, the electric company. That it is. It is what creates um, jobs. It's what creates futures. It's what creates careers. Then what people do with that, the owners of Starbucks, that's really the key. Mm -hmm. That business is not bad. It's how those businesses treat their employees, what their culture is, and what they do with that profit that is so very important. And so I don't have that ethical con d dilemma that I did in the cattle business, you know, that what I'm doing to help people build their wealth is hopefully going to be passed to help others. And, and I talk to them a lot about their health because it's, you know, that retirement, the glide path now is we're, we're living 11 years on average not feeling well. Those wonderful retirement years are not so wonderful because of their health. So trying, trying to coach them on that a little bit too. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. I just think um, it, it's true that when you learn, when God blesses you, if you invest it in others, yeah. it comes back to you. It does. We had a, the first year we had a little bit of a, of a moment of, of, of crisis because I kind of, I, when I say I gave all our money away, I didn't, I mean, I, we could pay the electric bill, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I, I had the money that we normally had, I, I kind of inadvertently had given it all away. And that next day our accountant called and told us because of what we had given away, what our tax refund was going to be. And it was to the dollar what, what I was short to make the bills. You know, and it's like, oh my gosh. I just, you know, I, I, I just had a situation financially, which, which was a positive thing for us. And I wanted to help my brother who still lives in Kansas and is the best human that I know. <laughs> He's just the best. He's in his 15th year of reading the Bible through. Um, and he has medical bills. And I, I had gotten this windfall of financially and I thought, I am gonna give my brother 20% of that. And the next day he called and we were talking and just, and he was so thankful because his $57,000 medical bill had been reduced 
to this amount. And it was to the dollar what I was going to give him. Wow. Wow. It just about brings tears to my eyes because, and it, you know, it's just amazing. That is, those are miracles that happen that we can't miss. There's so many that we miss, but um, it's, it's just money. Money is nothing, but it can be everything to some people. It does not buy happiness, but it buys freedom from stress. When, when you are stranded or you have little children that are sick or you need help with feeding the children, you know, it's, it's, it can be miraculous. And that flipping that switch inside, it was so liberating because then we don't, we never, we, if we give it all away, We've got clothes. We've got friends. We will not starve. And why just build it up? It's a beautiful reminder that like God provides for his people. Yes. And that he provided for the Israelites in Egypt and he pro- yes. and he still provides over for us and now. Over. And it's just such an amazing reminder that he's still good and he still looks after us. Every single one of us. In every engagement with our discussions today, he's planting seeds in our hearts. And you may have heard this study long ago. I don't remember where it started. I think it was a motivational speaker that said, you become the five people you hang out with the most. Studies recently by the Blue Zones. Have you heard of the Blue Zones? You'll want to read about it. It's super cool. There are now six, but there originally were five blue zones identified 20 years ago where people live the best and longest. And it's all over the world, but they have similar frameworks about spirituality, about what they eat, about how they move. Um, but anyway, in, in, in the blue zone studies, it's continued. They've, they've really found that we become everyone around us. And isn't that exciting that you're, if you have one conversation with another person, with another child, and that's the only conversation you ever have with them, you can influence them. And that's so exciting. And you influence me today, you know, with, with this. So it's, it can multiply that impact, which I think is super cool. Mm-hmm. I know that the five people you hang out with the most probably have the biggest impact you know, but you're going to meet people in your life that you have one interaction with and they're going to flip that switch or you're going to flip theirs and just bringing up the concept of generosity and what that means. If, if I hadn't heard about that, I, I'd have missed out on so much. And it's sometimes what keeps me thinking I need, I want to keep working because there are ministries that kind of depend on us now, you know, and we want to see that through and God willing, I'll live long enough to (laughs) see that happen. Other questions? You have any more? What accomplishments give you the most satisfaction? Two weeks ago, bringing 10 men in our community together with 10 women in our community to end sexual assault and seeing those men and how much they care moved me deeply. You know, just being a part of bringing that together. Um, For my birthday, which was yesterday, but on Saturday, I brought 10 friends together. I mentioned that one was from Illinois that I haven't seen in 15 years, another one from Nashville, another one from New York. And just that energy of all of these women and their stories. It was, you know, I am a connector. I, 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 I don't know why or how, but I, I just set the stage for things to happen. And that brings me the most joy, connecting those people. Um, and because of that, I think people contact me to be a connector. I'm connecting someone at Vanderbilt because their niece's daughter who goes to Notre Dame thinks she wants to go to Vanderbilt and they don't know anybody there. So she called me to, you know, and, and that follow through and what happens next, I'm not the greatest at, <laughs> you know, I, I, I let it organically just take life. Um, but I think that's what 
brings me the most joy. And, and definitely, definitely seeing, I, we take, this is the third year that we've taken people to a conference that is, is focused on physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, and clinical dietitians to heal healthcare. You know, we, we should not have Chick-fil-A in a hospital or McDonald's. We should not cook 50 pounds of bacon every morning and feed it to our patients, you know, and moving that needle and just, they're like, <laughs> you know, to opening their eyes to me is just so exciting. So this is the third year and we have a couple of physicians that I think are going to be the champions to help. And it's, it's happening in... In New York, for example, if you take a 10-minute subway ride from one zip code to another zip code, the life expectancy goes down 10 years in our country. That is, that is a health inequity is what it is. And they're working very, very hard in that, in Brooklyn, to really make those changes in those healthcare centers, in those community centers, in churches, um, in clinics, and it's working. That's super cool. So, <laughs> and then I love, I love what I do here. I've never had a Sunday where I had, I think they call it scary Sundays, where you're like, oh, I have to go to work Monday, I have to mingle home. I've always looked forward to it. Tracy's not here today, but she's been with me 17 years. And then Nancy, I love, I mean, how we show up every day is so positive. We assume positive intent. We assume that everybody's going to come into us with a positive attitude. And if not, there's a reason. Um, are any of you familiar with the four agreements? We kind of live by that. I, I am not sure the origin. It may be Buddhist. It may be, I don't know. But the four agreements are, I'm always impeccable with my words. What I say and do matters even in the words I tell myself. We gotta not be so hard on ourselves a lot of times. Number two is if I'm impeccable with my words, no matter what, I don't take anything personally. Now if I was bad, I, it's, and somebody comes back to me, I need to own that. I have to take that personally, I did it. But if I'm impeccable with my words, they've got something going on. Help them with whatever that is. Thirdly, I always give others the benefit of the doubt. Some people will come in and they're very, very, very stressed and they're not kind always. Something's going on. Help them. Give them the benefit of the doubt that something's going on. And then last, and, and in that, not everybody thinks the way I think. Just, you know, accept it. You know, we're, we're going to be different. And then last but not least, I always do my best. Some days that's not as great as others and give, give myself grace on that. And that has helped in many organizations I'm in, in, in work situations, just to kind of, oh, yeah. So anyway, it's a great little book. It's a very little book. I just want to get to four agreements. Tell me what they are. <laughs> and they're good. They really are. <laughs> but love what you do. There's so many opportunities out there to not love what you do. It doesn't matter how much money you make or not. It's are you serving your purpose? And there's so many opportunities and you are obviously leaning into that, all of you. Um, oh, what a great, oh, what a great fit, but what a great opportunity for you to be a part of this. And we we have a, a little my husband and I lives in Florida in the winter. <laughs> oh, that sounds odd. We have a little bitty house down there in a little bitty, very um, not pretentious community with people of all ages, all colors, all backgrounds. And we hope the next few days it'll be okay. The hurricane is headed right for it. But in that community is this urban farm that is amazing right in town of four blocks of these vegetables, these, and they're wanting to do what you all have done as a school. And so we've given them the book, you know, and you told us about the book. And 
you just never know. Those seeds are literally planted. And so they're wanting to start a prodigy-like yes, school. Yes, yeah. yes, which is, they've got that garden there. They've got the little ones there. The uh, A young family bought it, and it's very successful. Um, and so you just, yeah, you never know. So if you hadn't taken that role and talked to me, I, you wouldn't have had the we, book. Yeah, you so couldn't we have were passed headed down like two weeks later, uh, like a couple of months ago. And I do go down and visit my husband. I fly down a couple of weeks and work remotely uh, while he's down there. I want to follow up on one thing that you just said to give some direction, particularly to the peers of our interviewers today, yeah. about the impact of how you show up on the people around you. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more yeah. about that? How we show up matters. And we have, we've all got stuff going on. We, my husband and I, just always from day one, when, when I grew up, there was no such word as drama other than drama class. And that was acting, you know? Mm -hmm. And we, we just have agreed, we just don't do drama. And we just, it's a foreign entity to us. Everybody has some stuff in their lives. And I still have a responsibility to be my very best to other people and not let that cloud what God has given me. Or even though, you know, we've had heartache, we've had hard times, we, we are called to, to show up at our best mm -hmm. because we know it influences the day. It influences we don't know the ripple effect. And if more and more people could show up with truth, with, you know, I, I read something this morning about the difference between misinformation and disinformation. We can always slip up and, and pass something on that we didn't realize wasn't right. That's misinformation. But the disinformation of purposefully planting things, you know, if we can just show up with truth, what a difference, you know, it would be in our world. And I have great hope that we are, we, we are moving to that. And it's young people like you who, who can do that. And I would just add, sometimes our best is to show up and be on, when you say the truth, sometimes our best is to show up and be vulnerable enough to say, I'm not yes, my best today. I'm not, I need, I'm not doing very well today. And, and watch people. I mean, you've seen this out at, a prodigy when you do that the way that people surround you and yeah. want to be helpful to you actually helps them bring their best to you so we can either bring our best which looks like best or we can bring our best which looks like honesty and vulnerability right, right? so I think and that's being important. humble too you know that it's easy as you get into careers and things it's easy to forget um humility and our at our church our pastor um did a sermon on a book that's 150 years old and the name of it is humility and it has rocked my world and because of that book i created another group we meet once a month on wednesday mornings because they're the most humble people i know and i want to be more like them and vulnerable and and sometimes we're just a pile of corpuscles <laughs> trying to get by you know and yeah. And I hope you understand what I mean by drama. I was a critical care nurse. And my first um, loss of life was a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. And at the age of 21, that kind of sets the tone for what big things are and what drama nothing is, you know, so I don't have a high, <laughs> high tolerance for little stuff. You know, it's, um, you know, this we can fix. This is nothing. You know, we can we don't need to make a big thing out of this, you know, big things will happen. And so anyway, a bad haircut is not worth tears. <laughs> so in my opinion. Uh, what are three um, practical tips we can use for our health? Like every day, every day. Good question. I'm going to give you some things to take with you because I keep them here. But the number one thing is dairy. Our gut is not designed to take in casein, which is whey, casein, the products in dairy food. 
80% of individuals of color are lactose intolerant, 40% of Caucasians are. Yet we give it to kids every day in school and it affects our microbiome to the point, which is that amazing eight pounds of bacteria that we have in us, to the point that if you have a cup of yogurt and you put blueberries in it, the the nutritional impact of the antioxidants, minerals, and vitamins in the dairy is completely obliterated. I'm sorry, in the blueberries is completely obliterated by the dairy. So dairy is, cheese is the trifecta of, of illness because of the sodium, the salt, the saturated fat, and the addiction part of it. It's very addicting. And so I will challenge you to try that for one week, no cheese, goat, our gut can handle goat cheese, feta, etc. And we don't overeat it because it's it's like you can't you can't get addicted to broccoli. You know, those foods that are real foods don't addict us. And goat does not have the casein, they don't add all the salt, etc. Um, dairy is, is first minimizing the saturated fat of um, animal products, but the worst animal products are, are the processed ones. They directly cause cancer. That's sausage, hot dogs, ham, turkey, deli turkey, um, um, yeah, anything processed, bacon, anything that has those additives. Um, so that would be number two. Um, and number three, just lean into greens and beans. The more green stuff you can eat and the more beans you can consume, the less you'll eat of the other. They have, uh, you know, the, it, it's not been an evil conspiracy at all, but companies that sell products, they exist to make money for their shareholders. So if their product is pasta sauce and they figure out the more sugar we put in, the more we sell, I mean, that's that's not an evil conspiracy. That That's their... That's their careers, that's their business. But they have highly processed things to the point that they actually have individuals who achieve what they call in the research, the bliss factor, the crunch, the smooth, the creamy, the sweet, the how does that hit our palate? And it has changed our palates. So as we get rid of that, we will appreciate when we eat a peach so differently or a tomato, or because our palate has been hypersensitized to these other things. And as it becomes more natural, it gets easier. Well, Cheryl, I know you're a busy person and involved in a lot of things. So thank you so much for taking the time this morning. This has been awesome. Every time I get to be around you, I learn new things and I'm inspired towards new things. And so I'm grateful and I'm grateful to our students who yes, did a wonderful so job impressed. for asking the questions. And hopefully you were blessed like I was during this time. So thank you so much. Yeah.